you're tuned into the Edible Activist Podcast. I am your host and favorite go-to edible activist, Melissa L. Jones. On this show, we serve up empowering narratives and fresh perspectives straight from the voices of emerging Black people and people of color in agriculture and business. And in these candid conversations, we might sprinkle in a few choice words. They're the ones stewarding the land, healing communities, and championing food justice and economic empowerment across the country. Their contributions and stories sprouted from the earth, truly embody the spirit of activism in their own unique edible ways. So let's dig in and get started. Peace. This is your host and favorite edible activist, Melissa L. Jones, greeting you at the top of September. I have a returning guest, and I think at this point, a co-star, which you're probably <laughs> right. She's laughing. <laughs> La Monica Jones, who is the director of DC Hunger Solutions, and I'm excited to have her back, always gleaning from her amazing um, knowledge. And so thank you for joining me again. Yeah, thank you for having me back. I'm always excited to come and share space. You know that. I do. I do. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. So y'all, in this episode, we want to bring you some very brief but key food security updates, um, which will be honestly the intentions for um, this episode and episodes moving forward, which is hint, hint, we want Monica back more regularly. (laughs) (laughs) I think she likes hanging out here. I do, I do. (laughs) But Monica's work and the entire organization is just so important to the entire food ecosystem um, in D.C. and Maryland at large um, and, you know, the surrounding metro area. So definitely want to have her on to provide those key updates that impacts all of us in the city in Maryland. Um, So we're going to go ahead and jump in, but new month, Monica, you know, nearing a a new season, Equinox is, is, Equinox is almost here. So new things, new things, but listen, the work still continues, right? Always, always. (laughs) There's still hungry people to feed. Still hungry people to feed. We, last time we spoke was back in May, Mm -hmm. you know, and we, we talked about a few things. And so at the top of my list, one of the things that we talked about was, um, SNAP benefits and like the increase, um, the allotment increase that that took place and the emergency allotment, let me correct myself, and wanted to revisit that because one of the um, concerns that we touched on to my memory last time we spoke was, you know, looking at what that looks like for the fall, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so just want to update on what can we expect, you know, for SNAP in regards to the the increase that did happen, you know, for the emergency allotment and, um, you know, how our, how SNAP recipients would maybe impact it. Yeah. So, well, the um, SNAP emergency allotments, they ended uh, back in February of, um, uh, I think last year, 23. Okay. Oh, it ended. Okay. So the snap, emer- the snap emergency allotment was, um, it was allocated during the pandemic. Right. And so that was out of a need to make sure that we are addressing food insecurity during mm-hmm. the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but what we did locally was give snap a raise, which is what I think we talked about ah, the last yes. time was give Thank snap you. a raise. Give snap a raise. Yes. So the end of 23, uh, January 2023, mm-hmm. it was officially signed in legislation. Um, we passed give snap a raise and through an excess revenue amendment that was introduced by council member Janice Lewis George, we were able to fund temporarily give snap a raise from January through September 30th. Um, and one of the challenges that we that we had with Give Snap a Raise was that it was such a high dollar amount. So I believe on the first implementation year, it was a fifty nine million dollar legislation. And so okay. part of that would go to some technology upgrades mm-hmm. that were needed for that's right um, DHS uh, and their work with district with. Um, Healthcare finance to make sure that district direct was updated mm-hmm. and the, the technology was ready to go. And then the rest of it would be allocated to our SNAP recipients across the district. For those who may not be familiar with district direct, you just want to tell some. Oh, about sure. That. Yeah. District direct is that's the, important. It is. It is. It is. It is. <laughs> district direct is the online system that DHS uses to disperse their benefits. So not just SNAP, but if you're receiving TANF. 
Um, if you are uh, any other benefit system, you, Medicaid, Medicare, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you use District Direct. It's just an online portal, and it makes it a lot easier for residents that are receiving these benefits to submit applications, to submit recertifications, to submit their documents directly to the state agency in lieu of having to go in person to uh, one of the service centers. Mm-hmm. They can submit their documents online via District Direct. And that's part of the work that we do is working with SNAP clients across the district that um, maybe they're having challenges with District Direct or maybe they are just customarily used to going into a service center and need help with accessing and creating an online account, we will work with district residents to get them set up um, so that they're using District Direct. And it's it's a quicker process than having to go um, to a service center. So that's what District Direct is. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. We're about educating the audience. <laughs> um, but so with Give Stop a Raise, the benefits were from January of this year through uh, September 30th. And so starting in February was when the actual distribution began. So mm-hmm. uh SNAP clients what we in February received January and February's disbursement and then in March they got back on track. Okay. Unfortunately, because the uh excess revenue amendment, it was funded via an excess revenue amendment amendment and it was temporary. Um it was only funded through September thirtieth. So um we've shared on our if you go to our website and look at our which is dchunger.org and look at our SNAP tip of the month, you'll see instructions on what our SNAP clients can expect okay. starting in October. And so DHS, I believe, submitted uh sent out paperwork notifications to um, all of our SNAP clients across the district, letting them know that those give SNAP a raise benefits that that they were going to be ending as of September 30th and starting October 1, you're going to go back down to your previously um, allocated. Can you remind the audience, and first of all, thank you for correcting me. So we had the emergency allotment that ended earlier this year in February, right? Um, SNAP emergency allotments ended 2023. 2023 in February. And then the Give SNAP a raise, that was this year. Mm-hmm, that okay. started this year. To the end of September this month, which mm-hmm. is approaching. Um, and one of the la- one of the things that we had talked about last time was um, the the percentage increase of the Give SNAP a raise. And I was just like, that doesn't sound like too much. But you broke it down, as LaMonica always does, when you think <laughs> about other things and priorities that families have to pay for. So if you can remind us what that raise was for this year. Mm -hmm. So with Give Snap a Raise, um, unlike some of our other states that have a supplemental SNAP amount, Give Snap a Raise allocated 10% on top of a SNAP client's maximum federal allotment amount. So that amount varies. Okay. Um, It's not like a set amount so that you'll, you know, if you are an older adult, you're going to receive, you know, $75 or, you know, just whatever a set amount it, depending on what your maximum allotment is. And that allotment is determined based off of income and household size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, You would receive an additional 10% on top of that. And so that for, depending on, again, your household dynamic, that could be a, very vast. So for our older adults, that's who has been impacted and will be impacted the most because for many of our older adults, they are only eligible for the $30 minimum. And so way back prior to um, when the more education and knowledge. Yeah. In 2021, as a result of the pandemic, USDA revised the Thrifty Food Plan. Now the Thrifty Food Plan is a plan that puts in place a lot of different factors, but that's what is used to determine the minimum amount that a SNAP Mm -hmm. client is eligible for. So for those that are listening and that are interested, Google USDA thrifty food plan. I did not know that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's (laughs) It's a nice hefty document, but you can read through it to determine how USDA comes up with the minimum yeah. amount that is allocated to a SNAP client. I'm afraid to read it, actually. <laughs> they actually have, like, some quick one-pagers in there, too. Not because of, like, the depth of it, mm-hmm. but just from the standpoint of, like, determining, like... Read it. 
I, I know. I know. I, I knew you were going to say I, that. I yes, encourage I know. everyone to read it because what it does is that I am who I am and our work is what our work yeah. is. It gives you, paints the picture of why it is so important to address the root causes of hunger Mm -hmm. and the systemic challenges with actually ending hunger and poverty across our entire nation. Mm -hmm. And so all of these factors are in play. It's it's income, it's inflation, um, it's all these different factors that go into play. And it really gets your mind to wonder, well, why are people paying this? And why are they receiving incentives on this? And how can we make sure that we're holding legislators accountable to really address this? What can I do? Um, we're coming up on an election year. Yeah. What can I do as a uh, a resident of a given jurisdiction to make sure that um, I'm doing everything that I can? And so I encourage it. it it's, it's not... Uh, regulatory language not okay. all of it is regulatory language a lot of it is just explaining it so that people understand it and just by the nature of this is a document that governs so to speak um the nation's largest response to hunger mm-hmm. there's a lot in there mm-hmm. um, but there's some there's some good one pages that usda has put together so that okay. it breaks it down for people that just want to understand what the thrifty food plan is okay um there's some good information thank you um but anyway the thrifty food plan back in 2021 was revised to bump up benefits from 16 dollars up to 23 dollars um as a result of what was occurring from the pandemic um kind of in a counter to that Prior to that, uh, D.C., with the work of D.C. Hunger Solutions, um, they increased the minimum from 16 to $30. And so that's where we sit. So if you are a district resident and you are eligible for SNAP, the lowest that you can receive is $30, while currently the federal minimum is $23. And so there's still some work that we're encouraging through the Farm Bill, which... Mm-hmm. SNAP sits underneath the farm bill, and we are in a farm bill year. Mm-hmm. Um, and farm bill covers a host of other programs. SNAP is, is one of them. TFAP is another one. Um, through farm bill, we're encouraging USDA and our legislators not to roll back the provisions of the thrifty food plan to keep them uh-huh. in place. Um, and so through the SNAP Expansion Act, our district residents receive a minimum of $30. With give snap or raise, um, for our, and I think we were getting into this with just with a conversation on our older adults. Our older adults are impacted the most because for a lot of our older adults, they're receiving Social Security. Right. Social Security is counted as income. As income. Mm-hmm. It's unearned income. Mm-hmm. So where you could be receiving the maximum of, I think it's $291. Um, there are our older our older adults that are receiving only thirty dollars wow. because of that unearned income that's counted against them. So when you factor in give snap or raise, although they may have only been receiving an additional twenty six dollars, maybe an additional fifty dollars, that's still more than thirty dollars that I had. Right. You know, and so we're taking that away. D.C. is still highest when it comes to older adult hunger across our nation. Mm -hmm. And so when you strip all that away from our older adults, from our most vulnerable populations, Mm -hmm. we're left with increasing number of individuals that are experiencing hunger. Um, As we draw closer to the end, sorry, y'all, I don't mean to bust your bubble, but when a a new month starts, I'm like, it's about to end, right? (laughs) (laughs) So we talk about September 30. 30th and um, the conclusion of gifts and upper raise, like those additional benefits. Um, and as you know, your organization that works with residents on their applications and just filtering questions and helping them navigate the system or actually, and if you're having issues with the systems, I'm just curious, like what, what has been some of the, what have some of those conversations been like? You know, like I'm I'm a person who receives SNAP benefits and food is still high. You know, I think there's some chatter about food prices going down. But like, listen, we were just talking a few moments ago, buy three things and it's $100, right? Like it still mm-hmm. feels like food is still expensive. And I'm afraid. Like what, 
how are you all navigating those conversations? You know, um, pretty much in the same way that we did when, if um, people remember, we had a pandemic EBT, and that was. Mm-hmm. Funding that was allocated specifically to our kids, mm-hmm. um, whether you were childcare age or uh, school age, um, and then the SNAP emergency allotments. So we're handling it the same way that we did with those conversations. It'll probably take people a minute to actually feel the effects of it. Yeah. So when the SNAP emergency allotments ended, Um, it took folks a minute to realize that, oh, I don't have this extra income on my SNAP benefits for um, families may have experienced it a little bit differently and a little bit sooner because you were having your regular SNAP benefits, but then you were receiving um, an additional amount based off of the number of children. Mm -hmm. So each one of your children received an additional Mm -hmm. amount. And so you feel that drop off immediately when those programs ended. And so the anticipation is that as we are working with our SNAP clients across the district, we will begin to probably around the holidays, um, maybe before, maybe end of October, beginning of November, we'll begin to hear from families saying, my benefits went down and what do I do? Yeah. Um, so they'll begin to feel the, the effects of that. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the good thing is that this is, a good primer for budget season as we start budget season again in 2025 and reasons why, um, we need to encourage DC council to make sure that intentional investments are made mm-hmm. to, um, fund non-lapsing ongoing funding of give snap arrays um usda just released their household food and security report last wednesday okay and although dc's food insecurity rate had went down from i think nine point it's at 8.8 percent. i think it went down from oh about 10 percent. but think, a lot of that was due it. to the programs that were in place. And so this year we'll be ah. we'll begin to feel mm-hmm. what is it? There's still about food insecurity in DC, there's still about a little over 330,000 residents that are dealing with food insecurity. Um and so when you look at that correlate that to the the number of residents, it's still about it's about 8% of um, households that are experiencing food insecurity at some point. So, you know, the, the report addresses food insecurity, low food insecurity, and very low food insecurity. Um, in that report, USDA outlines that households of color um, experience it at a disproportionate rate. Our immigrant families are experiencing food insecurity at a disproportionate rate. And so with the ending of Give, Snap, or Raise, th- this will be a primer for, number one, recognizing that DC has has in a lot of cases been on the front end of addressing hunger and poverty within the district. There's been a lot of advancements whether it's been free school breakfast for right. all DC school students, the SNAP expansion act, give SNAP a raise, um, we're hopeful about universal school meals, um, allocating funding to programs like Produce RX, um, joyful food markets and these are all programs with yeah. a lot of our partners. Um, so DC has been on the leading edge of making sure that they that funding is allocated to address hunger and poverty. And so this coming up budget season is no different. That there has to be intentional efforts that are made to fund, refund, give snap arrays, um, so that we can continue to address hunger and poverty. Because like I always say, food safety and shelter are the things that we have to address first. Like if I can't do anything if I if I didn't eat today, try to function without food. It's, can't. You can't go far. There's a reason why breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It breaks that fast. It gives you the energy that you need to keep going. And so um, for people that are struggling with hunger and I don't know, I don't have enough to, to eat or, you know, my kids are eating first, which is typically what will happen. A parent will go without so that their child can eat. But if the child is responsible for, if the parent is responsible for taking care of the entire household, Mm -hmm. there's only so much a parent can do with no food and zero energy. Like, so it's a whole system and a whole family approach. If you feed the family, you feed the child. Um, And so, you know, 
looking at how we'll be impacted um, over the next couple of months is a primer for what we need to address when it comes to this upcoming budget season. Yeah. Well, speaking about the next couple of months, <laughs> this is a big year. <laughs> for a lot of different people for and a, a lot, lot of different, different reasons. Yes. <laughs> yes. So curious. To, I mean, I could listen to LaMonica's, you know, not just her thoughts, her wisdom, her <laughs> knowledge, everything all day, right? So um, as we know, you know, we 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 might have a new administration. Like, that's what we hope for. We're, we're ho- <laughs> please. <laughs> some, listen, some might not want it, but I'm just saying we might. So Democracy crossed. is definitely in play here. Uh, yeah, no, for real. <laughs> If if we need a civics lesson yes. on how I'm just a bill, only a bill, sitting on Capitol Hill. If we need to, we need to roll back uh, Schoolhouse Rock mm. to learn how the government works real quick mm, mm, and how mm, elections mm, mm, work mm. and how legislation works. And shout out to the to the you know community leaders and activators who are actually doing some of that re- that that reminding of how it works on I will, on, on social. Like I will they're not say, playing. No, they're not. I was <laughs> talking all. to my cousin and she was telling me just how energized her husband is about voting and getting active. And I mean, I these past couple of I, I lived in Georgia past couple presidential elections. Mm-hmm. So that was a different type of energy. Yeah. Yeah. For um, sure. <laughs> but I don't think I've seen this type of energy mm-hmm. around voting since uh, Barack Obama yeah. was um, since 2008. Mm-hmm. And so um, she just, it, it's just a, to, to see so many people like, I want to learn, I want to understand, you know, I've heard people, certain people groups taking accountability yeah. for how they've shown up over the past um, administration and over the past couple of years and, and realizing, you know, how am I hindering or uh, growing, you know, what our society looks like and hearing from people that don't live in the U.S. Mm-hmm. and their thoughts and how they're being impacted. Um, everything is, is a lesson, whether it goes our way or not. Um, every single thing is a lesson. And if at the end of the day, the only thing that we get out of this next couple months in process is that I've learned how to be a better citizen mm. and a better get better at expressing and utilizing my voice mm-hmm. and and learning. I call as a as a former educator, I call it a lesson learned. Mm. If out of if if anything over these past, if nothing else, you know, this probably is an off the record response but if there's anything i learned over the past 10 years or so um everything is a learning lesson absolutely it didn't happen haphazardly there's something to be learned out of everything that we've endured as people in the united states of america mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. now is where we use that to to support the programs and the people that we know need the most well, I'm sure there's there's lots of there's lots of conversations everywhere, right? But in this food space, it just be curious. There's a couple just a couple of minutes just to hear your thoughts on how SNAP and other food programs would benefit from a possible new from a new administration. Let me not even let me take possible out, right? Because <laughs> there's so much as there's there's already so much at stake. But I'm just curious, like what those conversations are like, and what concerns if I don't want to say that it's it's based off of one particular administration okay. um, because Farm Bill is now. Yeah. And we've been dealing with Farm Bill for a couple years mm-hmm. in this administration. Um, yes, we have. And it, if we don't pass a Farm Bill now, it will be of concern for the next administration. Mm-hmm. So regardless of the administration that is is leading the charge, um, we need to make sure that we are making those investments, that we are communicating what does hunger 
and poverty look like? Yeah. How is this going to impact our economy? How is this going to impact our system? And make sure that we are having conversations with the right people and have the right people in play to re- that really understand mm-hmm. and that have the... I was just at a food bank earlier today and we were talking and we were just saying one of the things that we need to make sure is that the political will exists to address these issues. If the political will does not exist to address these issues, we will continue to be in the cycle of of how are we going to address it? What are we going to do? Right. Um, right. One thing I will say that we are really excited about is um, because we know that um, there's been such movement behind Healthy School Meals for All that we are really excited and really charged that Healthy School Meals for All, just the energy behind it. Um, If anyone watches the John Oliver show on HBO... I don't. Okay. Uh, I believe it's... share. (laughs) It's kind of like... uh, John Stewart meets uh what did he call himself last night? He called himself the White Steve Urkel is what he called himself. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he called himself he called himself the White Steve Urkel that has opinions on everything is what he said. So give it like John Stewart meets Stephen Colbert. Like it's it's something yeah. like that. And okay. So, and so I believe he puts his show on YouTube on Thursdays okay. um, if you don't have HBO. Okay. But I'm he a did big a Family Matters fan, by the way. You just said, the, I said I'm a big Family Matters yeah, fan, by the way, just by the Steve Urkel like, Come on now, TGIF. <laughs> TGIF, come, right, come on, on now. now. We come on and wear Fridays. <laughs> Friday, I couldn't wait until Looney Tunes went off at 7.30 on a Friday so that Family Matters came on. Listen, me and my brother, no. Nostalgia. <laughs> Listen, a 90, 90s kids, 80s, Listen, it's the there's best. nothing like growing up in the 90s. The like, there's so much nostalgia being a 90 kid, being a 90s kid. The best. Um, but he had a, he had, John Oliver had a really good segment yesterday on... Um, the importance of school meals and not just passing universal school meals legislation, but looking at um, our nutrition standards, looking at um, building in how we're addressing a food access within the school system. So lunch shaming was built into that. Um, working with making sure that there was access to healthy foods was was lumped into there. And that's part of the work that we're doing here in D.C. through Good Food Purchasing Program, um, with Councilmember Henderson and introducing universal school meals. But we're really excited about just the energy behind that um, with the possibility of a Harris Waltz administration. Um, you know, so, but above all else, regardless of what the administration looks yeah. like, um, there still needs to be ongoing investment because hunger is hunger. It yeah. doesn't go away. It does not. Based off of who's in charge. Yeah. But there has to be ongoing investment that is made um, to make sure that we have a farm bill, that Mm -hmm. um, we were addressing benefit adequacy, that we're factoring in inflation, that we're looking at how can people utilize their benefits, whether it's SNAP or WIC. Can we use this online? Um, Are we looking at transportation? Are we looking at um, all the all the things, environment, climate, you know, mm-hmm. I've been here for a year and listened to your plenty of your episodes mm-hmm. and know that of all the growers that you you interface with and you interact with, like the environment affects all of that. We know that it's warmer east of the Anacostia than it is over here in Adams Morgan. Right. So, you know, what does that How does that play when it comes to food insecurity? And so regardless of what our administration is, it's it's not just looking at our programs, but looking at all the intersectionalities and how it impacts our families and our households that are struggling with hunger and poverty uh, in D.C. and then across our nation. LaMonica said it. Whichever way this goes, we still have a mission. Absolutely. There's still work to do. (laughs) You know? It may be, we may have to do a little bit more work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We may have to do a little bit more Mm -hmm. work Mm -hmm. um, or a lot more Mm -hmm. work, but the work still continues and it still has to be done. What have, and we're going to wrap up in a few moments, but I am curious, especially, I mean, the farm bill, there have been lots of big topics, but the farm bill has been a very big one. Um, And speaking of lessons learned, and there's still so much work to be done with the farm bill, would have been 
some of the lessons or key takeaways that you've walked away with or just kind of have been with you and having these conversations as it as it relates to SNAP and other food programs as of late? Um, so one I know that's a loaded question. It's, it's <laughs> because a, I'm trying well, to, Monica I, looked up like, hmm, where do I draw from? That's, that's exactly <laughs> what was going through my mind is, let me just start with a conversation I had today. Um, so for those of you all that don't know, I also lead our organization, our sister organization, Maryland Hunger Solutions. So I have the benefit of addressing hunger and poverty in D.C. as well as across the state of Maryland. So I was in Anne Arundel County um, Food Bank this morning, and I was having a conversation, and Um, I shared with her, which I will share with all of you, that I am the lead for the Mid-Atlantic Anti-Hunger Coalition. So we are a coalition of advocates um, that address hunger and poverty and work to to bridge the relationship between USDA, our state agencies, and just make sure we have a very grounded and organic conversation in how we're addressing hunger and poverty. And a big piece of Farm Bill and that work on addressing hunger is our work with our food banks. A lot of times people don't understand just how food banks operate. For me, it's still a gray area. It's still me always learning um, just how different our food banks are across the the region. Um, And so I think, you know, within the Farm Bill, that's one area for us to look at to better understand is making sure that TFAP is fully funded and that it's, it's supported. We don't do a ton of work with TFAP, but in D.C., we do work with D.C. Health and sit on the advisory committee for TFAP. And that is making sure that our TFAP sites are informed about what it is, um, that our clients, meaning the residents that are visiting the TFAP sites, that they're, they're aware of the types of food that there's, uh, we're working to ensure that we can have the type of uh, culturally compliant, relevant, diverse foods that our TFAP recipients are asking for. And so that takes a, a collective conversation with our food banks because they are the administrators of TFAP. And so it's it's understanding what are their needs and what are the clients' needs in working together, you know, in terms of looking at Farm Bill and how that can be supported? I think the other thing that we're looking at with um, with TFAP is how we can support our, our college students. Not with TFAP, with Farm Bill is our college students. Um, and when I mean college students, I'm not just talking about an 18 to 24-year-old, anyone that is a – if you visit a campus, you could be any age, and if you are a college student – how does hunger impact you as a college student? There's a requirement for college students that accepting that are uh, wanting to participate in SNAP. They have to complete 20 hours of work study. For a college student, that is potentially very, very difficult if I have a, a massive caseload. And again, not a, reminding that college a college student is not just an 18 to 24-year-old. You could be of any age. And so encouraging our legislators to, it's through the EATS Act, E-A-T-S Act, um, making sure that we will uh, loosen the requirements for college students. I've talked to students at Howard. I've talked to students at American. I've talked to students at Georgetown. Um, There is a hunger-free campus legislation in the state of Maryland that addresses uh, hunger on college campuses. And so there's a dollar dollar amount that is allocated to college campuses, to their food pantry to address hunger on campus. And it's something that I'm hopeful we'll do here in D.C. as well. Um, But through Farm Bill from a national level, addressing what does campus hunger look like as well as... um, allowing, looking at the the variety in which or the diversity in which a SNAP client can utilize their benefits. So currently right now, SNAP clients cannot use their benefits on prepared prepackaged items. So you can't go to a grocery store and purchase a deli chicken and sides. You can't do that. And so really hopeful that people understand that in the same way that you or I may go and say, I don't feel like cooking dinner today. So I'm going to go grab this rotisserie chicken. I know me. So yeah. yeah. It's getting cold outside. I'm a fan of chicken and dumplings. Listen. I will take that rotisserie chicken yes. and I will cut it, slice it, dice it, and use it. Listen. And so we want to make sure that our SNAP clients have that same versatility and yes. that ability to That's utilize super important. their benefits. So all of that is kind of what we're look looking forward to when it comes to the farm bill. Mm-hmm. And there's many more provisions, but um, those are some of the things that we're looking forward to um, when, yeah. in terms of farm bill and making sure that the benefits um, that they're addressed and and it, that they're expanded for our SNAP clients. 
Wow. I want to have more conversations around um, colleges and food insecurity. It is definitely, I actually remember meeting someone like a couple years ago and that was like a black woman, that was her space and addressing that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I don't think that's talked up enough. Mm -hmm. Because people assume that I, when I go to school, number one, as an 18 to 24 year old that's going to school, I have a meal plan. And when I was in college, Hmm. I had a meal plan, plus I had a declining balance. And those were just points you could use to go and buy like a Taco Bell Mm -hmm. or a Mm Chick-fil-A. Wasn't Mm -hmm. what you were eating in the school cafeteria. Um, But as an 18 to 24 year old, I'm up all night, whether I'm up all night hanging out or I'm up all night studying. The cafeteria and stuff typically closes at seven. I I went to an HBCU, so I couldn't have a car my freshman year. Um, And so, again, lived in Atlanta, went to Clark. There was a store called Steagles. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Steagles was. Clark was an open, is an open campus. And so Steagles was at the end of the block and was open till 2 a.m. Wow. And so if we were hungry at 11 30, 12 o'clock, we could go down there and get some, yeah. <laughs> some wings, a ham and cheese sandwich, and something All to drink. And five dollars. <laughs> that's that's it. That's five dollars. That's it. Um, but not every college campus has that. Yeah. And not every college student has additional funding to do that. I'm trying to make sure that I can afford my classes and that I can pay for my books and stay. I'm just trying to make it being a student. I'm just trying to to get up and go to class every day. But Mm -hmm. again, the same challenges that persist with a K through 12 or a, a, a little, our littlest eaters, as I call them, is the same thing that is impacting our college students. How am I supposed to take this rigorous course load Mm -hmm. when realistically I have not had a, a full meal in days. Mm. I don't have the money. You know, I'm living in the cafeteria, but I'm also up till 10 o'clock in the, in the evening studying and the calf closes at 10 mm-hmm. and I can't take anything out of the calf or yeah. later. I can't have a microwave. What am I supposed to do? So we've got students on campus that are barely making it nutritionally. And so um, we definitely need to to address that because the disparities also exist depending on what type of college you are attending. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not, not there's, there's campuses that have multiple cafeterias and serve multiple different types. And then there's some that just don't have access to it. And if I go to a two-year, I may not have that type of access at all. At all. Right. And so we need to look at the disparities that exist on a college campus in general. So we'd love to to partner with um you and bring some some of yes. our college students from Howard Let's here, maybe it. from Georgetown, but any one of our area um I would colleges and universities um to kind of talk about, you know, what does that look like? I would love that. I would love that. Mm-hmm. La Monica, y'all I can stay here all evening. First of all, Shout out to La Monica for being here. She had a long <laughs> day and I got to get her home. Okay. Um, so thank you. Just thank it's you. It's always a pleasure. Thank it's you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Um, what, what can we, you know, look out for as you continue to do this great work? Like we're going to have her back in a couple more months so we can have some more key updates, you know, but is there anything significant that you want to point out? that we should lean into right now. Yeah, I'm not sure when this is going to air. Okay, soon, uh, sometime this month, in oh, September. Okay, yeah, before, okay. Before the 30th. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, uh, what we have going on for the, the kind of coming up is we will be, we're in the process of finalizing what our FY25 priorities will be. Okay. Um, what our policy priorities will be. Um, and so universal school meals, uh, give sample arrays, um, we really want to work towards just addressing our food system as a whole. So like I said, we do a lot of work with the Good Food Purchasing Program. Um, so there's a lot of exciting things that we're working on. We're trying to build up. Um, there's one really exciting um, event that we are. I'm trying my best to put all the pieces together. <laughs> Y'all have to know about me. It takes a whole lot to tell me No. <laughs> It takes a lot to tell me no. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, LaMonica, no. 
<laughs> but I'm like, we, we got to do it. So I'm really excited. There's one particular event that I'm excited about potentially working with um, the Green Scheme. Okay. And Shout don't, out the Green Scheme. Come <laughs> the on. Green Scheme and Don't Mute My Health. Okay. Um, yes. And so I'm really yes. excited. And some other partners across the district. That's awesome. So I'm really excited about a potential um, event there to okay. address our lack of grocery store access. Okay. Across the district. So I'm like, you're teaming up with the right people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so really, hopefully, hopefully yeah. we can get this done before the weather gets too cold. Yeah. Then we'll do that. Um, but yeah, outlining our policy and priorities, um, really looking into areas that um, we just need to build back up, working with our Spanish speakers, our immigrant families, um, really taking some intentional work on Working with our little ones, our, mm-hmm. our our little our littlest eaters, um, you know what policies have been in place for a while that need some revamping. So the Healthy Tots Act, where can we approve upon our policies? So really, just spending the last parts of the year um, really strategizing on what areas can we grow, what areas um, have we been impactful over the last 20 years um, and what can we look forward to in 2025? So staying true to who we are, but really approaching our work from a whole systems um, standpoint and really looking at the broader food system. So looking to, to work with growers and farmers and producers and help them kind of push them into this, how do I become a snap retailer? How do I, you know, mm. develop um, mobile pantries? And how do I accept snap at my, if it's just yeah. a small community yes. farm, how do I accept snap so we can get more produce into the bellies right. of our families? And so just really excited about, about building all that out. So stay tuned. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love, y'all see why I was bringing La Monica back? Like, for real. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. We look forward to having you back, but thank you for all the work that you do. I want you to get some rest, Um, but thank you all for tuning in. You can find this episode on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and until next time, peace. Thanks for tuning in. You can catch today's episode on iTunes, Spotify, and Simplecast. And be sure to follow us at Food Talks in Color, that's just the letter N, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.